cool um, technique called uh, DNA Seek. Um, also, uh, a similar technique called Attack Seek. Um, I'm going to call it very short now. So, Chip Seek. So, again, this is, I, I covered this very, very briefly. Um, but, um, so we take our, our DNA from our cell, we take our cells, and we treat these with form, um, formaldehyde. The formaldehyde will actually um, cross link uh, those transcription factors. Uh, to the DNA itself, forming permanent chemical bonds that wouldn't normally be there. Which is important because these are really loose interactions. These are um, mediated primarily by hydrogen bonds um, and a little bit van der Waals forces, but primarily hydrogen bonds. So there's no, no co covalent modifications here in vivo. Um, so we have to cross link those to make sure they stay there for the rest of the procedure. Um, so we break up, our, break up on ourselves, shear our DNA usually with, with sound waves. Sound waves are really good for breaking up DNA. Um, we had an antibody. Um, the antibodies will bind to whatever transcription factor you're, you want to look at. Um, and then a reaction uh, called immune precipitation uh, is sort of what goes on. So uh, you take your bound DNA um, and uh, you add some basically magnetic beads um, that have usually uh, a really common way to do this with something called protein, uh, protein A or protein G. Uh, which are proteins that specifically bind to um, antibodies. Uh, and so you'll pull out everything that's bound and wash everything else away. So what you have are strings of DNA that are near your transcription vectors, uh, your currently bound transcription vectors. Um, and then we sequence that. <coughs> this is kind of what ship seek data tends to look like. So um, to go over, this is actually for a transcription vector called um, NRSF, which is uh, primarily found in the brain. So the blue area here, yeah, that guy, um, here, is, that's your chip seek data. So you can see, it tends to, let's um, explain this. Um, well, here, I'll do it this way. This is a gene. Um, this is actually sequencing from, uh, trans transcript information from this gene. Uh, so you can see they tend to fall just upstream of the gene. Uh, you tend to get these increase in peaks. Um, so this tells you that, uh, in, life, in all likelihood, uh, this gene, which I have off the top of my head which one it is, um, is regulated by NRSF. Uh, what was the label for the y-axis? What's the units there? Um, those are copies. Okay, so yeah. the number of proteins generated? Mm -mm. No, these are, um, this is uh, reads, the number of ge genetic reads. So if there's more of those, so more of those DNA strands that are attached um, that you pull down, you'll get an increase in sigma. So it's <coughs> lots and lots of cells you're working with. So this is the, the DNA physically separating so that it can be read? Yes. Oh, okay, I, I, see, your, I see what you're getting at. So yeah. this, the, the, what this is saying, this is the amount of act, the cellular activity in terms of RNA that's actually being produced. Right. Okay, I, I got you. So, um, there are good and bad things about Gypsy. Um, it's really specific. I mean, it's, I mean, um, um, antibodies tend to be very, very specific to their targets. So you don't get a lot of off-target effect. You don't get a lot of, there's not a ton of noise in Gypsy, which is really nice. Um, and it's really awesome for looking at uh, differential gene expression between tissues because you can, you, you know, you can see how one transcription factor acts differently in different tissue types because these tend to be relatively tissue-specific kinds of things. Um, but you can look at one TF at a time, and there are about 200 uh, known TFs. So if you want to do this for a tissue, you're going to do 200 different chips of assays, um, which is going to run you about, <coughs> with your sequencing costs, about $18,000 uh, at this point. So it's very expensive. And ChipSeq is very, very laborious. Um, this takes about eight or nine days um, to get your library before you're even ready to sequence. It takes about eight days. Um, and it fails about 30% of the time. Um, it's just, it's such a complex procedure and it's, there's so many steps and it's really easy to, for very, very small things to disturb this. So, you people who've been doing this a long time. So, another option, um, this happens to be the thing that I worked on for about a year, um, is what's called DNA seq or attack, an attack seq. Um, these are two, really, two very closely related techniques for studying uh, DNA protein interactions. Uh, and I think this is, all. I just I just think it's pretty cool. Uh, um, so we isolate our DNAs from, from ourselves um, after we, before we, after we uh, 
again, do our trans transcription factor cross-linking. Um, and we treat these with um, either DNase-1 or uh, TN5 transposase. Uh, these are both uh, enzymes that cut the DNA in lots and lots of places. Uh, DNase is very, very nonspecific, as is um, TNF, uh, TN5. And what will happen is, uh, and then we sequence those. Um, so, with, and again, to remember that the DNA is bound to uh, the histones. So, um, if you get lots and lots of cuts in a region, it means that your chromatin is very open. Uh, it means it's very easy for transcription factors and for uh, transcription initiation machinery to uh, find and initiate <coughs> transcription. So, the likelihood that that's being actively transcribed or about to be tran actively transcribed. Well, whereas if you get few cuts, that means that's pretty closed DNA. It's really unlikely to be currently involved in any kind of transcription. Um, so, um, yeah. And then the protein itself, when it's if you have a protein bound there, it will actually protect that site from um, the DNA's activity, uh, and will form a region known as a footprint. We'll get to that in just a second. That's kind of what a footprint looks like. So again, here just, this is just read numbers um, from all of your fragments. And uh, so you see them quickly rise um, just before and just after. But here you have a really low number of cuts. Um, and the reason for that is that there's a transcription factor bound here. So the DNAs can't, ac can't access this site. Uh, this is also known as a, DNA, a DNAs protection assay. We actually used to do this um, in gel a long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> but it's much easier, much cooler to do it this way. And you can do a lot more of it. So yeah. Those are your footprints. Um, and again, this is more of that DNA seq data. Um, and again, these are the, the, these footprints that demonstrate the bound transcription factor. <coughs> Why are the peaks directly around? Um, there's a tendency. There's a lot of. Uh, I think if I can explain this from a, a steric standpoint. Um, for some reason, um, DNA really, really likes areas next to proteins. Why that actually is, we're not entirely sure at this point, but it does tend to cut much more. It tends to really like the sites. It also just tends to be that um, those tend to be a little bit more open. So, um, so we talked earlier about um, these things called QTLs, quantitative trait loci. Um, we talked about expression quantitative trait loci. So these are based on these are where your, your levels of, uh, where your change in the genome changes your level of expression. Um, well, there are other kinds of QTLs. Um, there are, in fact, DNA sensitivity QTLs. So these are similar to an eQTL, it's a genomic variant, um, that can alter, destroy, or create, ultimately, a foot, one of those footprints. Um, usually a single base change, and it will either prevent or induce transcription factor binding. Uh, and this has been a very promising um, new area of Research for uh, clinical genomics um, because lots of clinically, uh, lots of the, the known clinical variants uh, in the genome don't fall in protein coding regions. We don't know what they do. We just know that they, for some reason, that's associated with this particular disease. And we're starting to find these that they crop up in transcription factor binding sites. So instead of altering a protein, they're altering the expression of a protein. Probably. Yeah. I'll, I'll catch it. Um, so these are some ideas, this is a little bit of, of the SQTL, this is actually by uh, a colleague of mine uh, at Wayne, um, and this is actually done by a, a program called Centipede, uh, which is a really cool bioinformatics pipeline for looking at um, DSQTL, DSQTLs. Um, so uh, here we have um, some DNA seq data um, from three different individuals, uh, one of whom is a homozygote for TT. Right, for T, one of whom is uh, heterozygote, one of whom is uh, homozygous, homozygous, homozygous for C. Um, and as you can see, um, the guy who has, is a C homozygote is much more, is much more DNA sensitivity um, in this region than our guy who is homozygous for T. So this is a DSQTL. Um, and again, uh, uh, this is multiple individuals here, you can see. Uh, changes in expression. That's a little bit small. Um, um, so this is the mode. This is uh, this is called a dendrogram. Um, this is kind of hard to explain right now. Uh, what we're actually looking here is a, a 
transcription factor called NF kappa B tends to bind here. Um, and this is the sort of common epitope, um, common sequence that NF kappa B tends to bind to. Usually a C, usually a CC, AT, um, CC, CC. Um, they're usually about eight or nine bases. Um, and this, uh, this SNP, this single nucleotide polymorphism, is actually right here in this C. And this is the only absolute must for NF kappa B. Um, if this C changes, NF kappa B basically will not bind to this site. Um, so that's how you end up with this DSQTL. And we can validate that by doing ChIP-seq, which I talked about earlier. And you can see, looking at ChIP-seq, um, again, here are three individuals. Um, our guy who's homozygous for CC has a, this nice fat um, ChIP-seq peak, meaning that he has NF kappa B bound here. And our, uh, our homozygous for T, he's down here with basically no signal. And not unexpectedly, our heterozygous right in the middle. So now I'm going to skip the math here, because Q plots are hard to explain. Uh, okay, so I know I'm kind of rushing through lots of information here, and I apologize. I'm just trying to give a really good overview, um, not get into too much crazy detail. So LNCRNA is long non-coding RNA, which is what I am writing my dissertation on. So this is the thing that I am super excited to talk about. Um, so these are uh, so. Uh, so we talked about the central dogma, which is this whole uh, DNA RNA to protein. Uh, and yes, DNA is transcribed into, into, in, into RNA, but only sometimes does RNA become protein. Like This is not nearly as, as universal as everyone likes to think it is. And this is, again, just a nice model of uh, our, cent our central dogma. What, what else can RNA be transcribed? It's not, tra well, it's, it's always transcribed into, into RNA. Uh, it's, how do I explain it? Um, most RNA is not translated. Most RNA just acts as RNA. Uh, RNA has lots of functions, as it turns out, outside of acting as a messenger uh, to, for protein translation. Um, that's kind of what we're going to get into a little bit of here. So it would be what you have, DNA, RNA, protein, DNA, RNA, other things? Right. Okay. Yeah. The RNA doesn't actually turn into anything or guide anything. It actually has functions all of its own. Uh, for example, things like tRNA, which uh, bring the amino acids into the ribosome for uh, protein, to make protein. Um, uh, ribosomal RNA makes up is a structural element in the ribosome. Um, yeah, that's what I was sure. it's, My biology is kind of out of date, but it, that, that was what I understand. That there, that the ribosomes being <coughs> turned into protein or enzymes, and that's but that's all that can be turned into. Otherwise, the the RNA is being used for some other purposes. Right. What other purposes is the RNA being? Oh, as I mentioned, um, like I said, our, uh, ribosomal RNA in particular is, a, is part of the st physical structure of RNA of the ribosome. Uh, most of it is actually made of RNA. Um, microRNAs are regulatory uh, elements. Um, they bind to the, five, the three prime untranslated region of uh, messenger RNAs to prevent them from being translated. So it's an additional mechanism to which to control um, the expression of genes within the cell. Um, we're finding out lots of other things. We're still kind of just learning some of this stuff. This is all very, very new. Um, and uh, non encoding RNAs, which is what I deal with, uh, are also another um, primarily a regulatory mechanism. They bind to other RNAs um, or bind to the genome uh, in ways that um, enhance or repress the activity of certain genes. There are also things called ribozymes um, in uh, telomerase, which actually won someone a Nobel Prize not too long ago. Um, which allows the, the rebuilding of the telomeres at the end of chromosomes is a, ribos is, is a ribozyme. So it is all RNA and it acts as an enzyme. So not all enzymes are proteins, which is a really cool thing we're just finding out. So, I challenge the central dot more. So, um, again, proteins only comprise a, comprise a really small amount of the genome output. So, most of not all of what the genome is doing is making proteins. Um, so you make a transcript and it's spliced and processed and becomes, you know, you get these, you know, assemble the exons, you make your mRNA and translate it into protein. Um, but sometimes you have non-coding RNAs that do all kinds of other things. <coughs> or then sometimes the introns uh, are processed into things like snow RNAs or microRNAs. Lots going on here. So I'm going to talk a little. I'm going to go back to the C-value paradox that we talked about um, way, way back. Um, 
So we talked about this a little bit in, Geno in uh, Genomics 101, um, which is this whole idea that um, genome size doesn't really correlate at all to, to organism complexity. Um, yeah. So uh, mammals are down here, and plants and algae and amphibians are all much bigger. Insect, there are lots of insects that have bigger genomes than us. Uh, that is a zebrafish. He's got 25 chromosomes. He's got more chromosomes than us. Um, so we all tend to, most metazoans tend to appear to have about the same number of proteins, about 25, tend to make about 20,000 proteins. Um, so yeah, so this is known as the C-value paradox, C meaning complexity. Um, the complexity of the genome does not correlate with the complexity of the organism. Um, so where does this complexity come from? Um, so, this is where it's really interesting. Um, so while you can't correlate the amount of total genetic information, you can in fact correlate the amount of non-coding information. Um, and this is pretty, this, is, this was sort of the basis of what uh, has now become the, the, the basis of long encoding RNA work, because we find that the amount of non-coding DNA in an organism does correlate quite strongly to the complexity of the organism vertebrates being way up here at the top, um, and lots of prokaryotes down here. So ENCODE. Um, ENCODE is a consortium I'm a member of. It's the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, which is sort of the successor to the Human Genome Project. And this is really sort of the core organization for functional genomics here in, in the United States and actually around the world. Um, and we're looking to discover what every base of the human genome does. So ENCODE is uh, the, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements is, is the sort of long name for it. So in 2013, uh, which is the last time ENCODE published a really big paper, uh, there are actually 85 authors on this paper, um, uh, we now have a total of about 57,000 human genes, uh, which are just over 20,000 protein coding genes, uh, about 13,000 uh, long encoding RNA genes, about 9,000 small non-coding RNA genes, which are things like microRNAs and all of that, and then about 15,000 pseudogenes. Um, and pseudogenes are uh, an interesting area of genomic complexity that look like genes but don't function like genes, uh, either because they're lacking a transcription start site or missing open reading frames or things like that. Now, as you can see, most genes don't code for proteins, so they have to do something. Uh, in all likelihood, they're probably important. So our long encoding RNA guys here, um, they're, turns out they're kind of important in human, human disease. So uh, these are all pretty recent. These are all <coughs> in the last uh, five years, um, because really nothing was published about long encoding RNA until 2009. Um, they include things like activating P53, which is involved, which is a tumor suppressor gene, uh, CMIC, which is an oncogene. gene. Um, uh, PCGEM is prostate specific oncogene. Uh, again, P15. Um, so it appeared, at the very least, it's quite clear that uh, long non-coding RNAs are important in cancer. Um, so this was a big literature review uh, done about long non-coding RNAs in cancer. Uh, these all tend to have really kind of fun, weird names. Um, so the sort of best known one is something called Hulk. Um, which is the highly upper, <laughs> it's literally called the highly upper regulated liver cancer. That's all the gene is called. Um, because as it turns out, it's highly upper up regulated in liver cancer. Um, so it's in fact the most upregulated gene in uh, certain kinds of liver cancer. And uh, it looks like an mRNA, it's about 500 bases long. Um, it has splice junction, just like a, uh, a normal mRNA. I'm going to take you off topic for just a minute, but in terms of what you're talking about, in terms of these um, non-protein coding, um, you know, in terms of that relating to complexity of life, it kind of begs the question from an evolutionary biology point of view is, how does that relate? Okay, so you have the complexity is involved not in necessarily the, the genome, but in the, the non-coding aspects. So that, how does that relate evolutionarily to the creation of more complex life forms. And that is a, a very 
um, it's a fruitful area of research right now. Um, and there, we're only learning it a bit, you know, bits at a time. Um, and there are lots and lots of theories about that, um, most of which I could probably talk for about an hour on. Um, the basic idea is that um, because these are regulatory in nature, um, the ability to regulate um, gene expression allows us to develop more complex tissues and develops a more complex organism. That's sort of the prevailing theory, at least in those people who, in, in my, my field. I know, I mean, it's, it's like, they, they, they make this comparison between chimpanzees and humans that there's like 1% genetic difference. And that's true, it's just that but there is, a, a complexity-wise, there's a lot of difference between a chimpanzee and a human being. But yes. that's mostly biochemically in terms of how the brain is functioning. Right. Kind of um, and as it, as it turns out, actually, there's a, um, and I'm not going to talk about, I don't have any uh, slides on this, um, but there are, in fact, a lot of human-specific long non-coding RNAs. Um, and actually, my, the focus of my dissertation research is trying to connect uh, human-specific uh, long non-coding RNAs with the evolution of the human brain. Um, so that's cool. sort of what I, I, my primary area of interest is. So again, this is a, most of that research is less than a year old. Like that's a very very new area of research for us. So, um, so I'm going to get back to this real quick. Um, so what's interesting about Hulk? Um, is that it's um, primate-specific. Um, and there's also a lot of primate-specific long encoding RNAs. There are not many long encoding RNAs in anything that's not primate, um, on the order of about 10% less, um, which, again, makes, makes some interesting arguments from the evolutionary biology standpoint. Um, it has no open reading frames. Um, if you stick this into uh, a bacteria, it doesn't make anything. There's no protein products. We know it doesn't really code. Um, but if we do RNA interference uh, or RNA knockdown, um, which I'm not going to cover, but it's a, a cell biology technique which you can repress cell activity or repress the activity of, a, of, a, of an RNA. Um, if you repress Hulk, you actually have a phenotype uh, and then you can upregulation of a, uh, something called CDK8, um, as well as a tumor, a Canada tumor suppressor gene. So clearly it has both biological function and it is non coding is pretty cool. Uh, it's also uh, well known to be involved in all kinds of breast cancer, particularly involved in the SARC complex, um, which is used in uh, just the steroid receptor complex. Um, hot air, believe it or not, is actually the name of the gene, uh, is a particularly well known one that involves cancer metastasis, particularly in breast cancer. Um, so now we have this LNC RNA omics. <laughs> Uh, we will append omics to damn near anything these days. Um, and um, so this is just a couple of papers that been published this year. Um, actually, I'm sorry, this is 2013. I haven't updated these slides yet, I'm sorry. Uh, so P10, which is a common cancer gene, um, it's you know, adipogenesis, uh, influenza A, replication, all, all of these things involve long encoding RNAs. Um, 596 papers on long, long encoding RNAs. And, 2013, and it keeps getting bigger. So just in just in January of this year, um, we published. There were 78 papers published on long encoding RNAs. Uh, up to this point, I believe we're now up to about 275 papers published this year about LNC RNAs. Uh, and they do really do all kinds of things: uh, regulators of programming, uh, molecules recombination, um, myogenesis. Um, uh, organization of chromosomes, all kinds of things. So, that puts me perfectly at time. So, questions? You know, it's kind of a lot of crazy information all over the place. This is meant to be a much more general, much more uh, survey based idea uh, as opposed to um, the one on one course, which I did. So, uh, I think they've been finding recently as they try to replicate uh, progenitor cells or stem cells that. Uh, structure and maybe it's adjacent cells or external pressure on the cell uh, seems to be affecting how they differentiate. How do you control for that, uh, like external pressure on the cell as opposed to looking inside the cell? Um, well, Is that where maybe some of the noise comes from? <laughs> uh, in, the, um, wait, in, in vitro modeling is not perfect. Um, and, we, and that's something that's readily recognized. Um, we sort of do our basic level. Um, Research in in, uh, in vitro because it's cheap and it's easy and manipulative. 
uh, but ultimately do replicate these in, in organisms. Um, we do this, do this in mice and in, uh, in humans when we can, but uh, it's hard to let people, get people to let you cut a piece of their brain out for research. Uh, <laughs> I know, it makes it made my depression research really hard to do because they won't let me cut their brain out. But. <laughs> so, oh, this is completely off the topic. It's just that when I was going to college, I remember all the physics majors, they all were always putting down the biologists, they're always calling in like soft science. Yeah, have you noticed that, like, if you ever watched The Big Bang, it's the biologists who are the smart ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious, they are, but they're, they're smarter than the physicists. I think it's because we get to know more information. Like, uh, at the end of the day, like, biology is really complex, and I'm not going to say physics isn't complex, but at the same time, like, there's a lot more going on here that you have to all kind of keep in your head, and you can't just, like, I'm a genomist, but I have to know a lot about biochemistry and structural biology and anatomy and biochemistry and molecular biology and you know cell bio and all kinds of other fields in order to do what I do. And again, a biochemist has to know a lot of you know genetics and molecular biology and molecular biologist has to know biochemistry. And so we have to you know we have to know our other fields. Whereas if you're a string theorist, all you really care about is string theory. You don't really aren't going to pay much attention to eleven dimensional supergravity or anything like that. So. You also have to be more accepting of what you don't know. Yes. Because in biology, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been at these things where there's a panel and there's a variety of people, and it's the mathematicians and the physicists, and they, they say things like, oh, well, this is just basically a biological machine. And you sit there going, those analogies went out of date in like the 18th century. And I, there were biologists on the panel, and they were trying to explain how complex some of these mechanisms really okay. were. And these guys just ignore them. And every time we think we've uncovered all the complexity, we find new complexity. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just in a very, I'm sure we have a brief time, some idea of, is there some practical things you see coming out of this recently? Anything interesting you could share with us? Um, a few things. Um, uh, there's a particularly interesting protein in, um, um, uh, again, in liver, liver cancer seems to have this, be really popular these days. Uh, uh, not a protein, I'm sorry, uh, a long encoding RNA called MALOT, uh, which is metastasis, um, uh, metastasis associated liver adenoma transcript, MALOT. Um, as it turns out, um, like 95% of all um, metastatic liver cancers uh, make this LNC RNA, and essentially zero non metastatic ones make this LNC RNA. Um, so it's this become this very important prognostic indicator in uh, liver cancer, particularly in liver adenomas. Um, there are a few others. Uh, hot air and breast cancer is a similar one. Um, it's, a, it's a really potent marker of invasiveness um, and, and <coughs> uh, really to, to, to be metastatic. Um, a really, really cool one that I, I, I like to talk about, um, I wish I put the slides in here, but um, there was, uh, so MIR-122, MIR microRNA-122. Um, is involved, it is an important site for um, the infectiousness of um, uh, hepatitis C uh, because the, uh, when hepatitis C inserts its genome into the cellular genome, it tends to insert it right at that point. Um, and as it turns out, if you, um, you can block the ability of um, uh, HCV to be invasive by blocking, uh, by inhibiting that microRNA. Um, and it's become a, it's one of the potentially most curative, um, may, it may present a cure for um, hep C. Um, as it turns out, it also drastically lowers your cholesterol. Um, so it may turn out to also be a really awesome drug for things like uh, familial hyperlipidemia. So those are a couple of the things that I, I know have come out recently. Um, I actually, I'll, I'll talk about one more real quick. Um, a project I, I worked on for a while at a company out in, um, out in Boston. Uh, has developed what may be a novel treatment for spinal muscular atrophy. Um, um, by removing a specific, um, by inhibiting a specific repressor mechanism, we're able to upregulate uh, a protein called SMA2, or sorry, SMN2, uh, which can rescue um, cells that uh, don't express SMN1. So that uh, may turn out to be, at least if not a cure, a, a solid treatment for disease that is currently has zero treatments and kills people by the age of two. Oh, um, regarding trying to put what you're talking about in the context, should we think of that sort of 
that treatment or that the origin disease in the lung, in where <laughs> lung um, on that coding RNAs. Yes, thank you. Um, as like the most upstream component or catching the disease process somewhere in the mid course of its. Um, that's difficult to say. Um, mostly because it, trying to define exactly what is up and downstream in, in, in complex diseases is really hard. Um, right.